Today on Blue 58, it's only week three, but a bunch of interesting storylines are emerging around this Green Bay Packers team. Let's sort through them and see if we can't answer any questions about this team along the way. Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I'm your host, John Meerdink, happy to be with you here for another episode. Got a lot going on today. A bunch of different things that I want to get to. I'm not even sure if we're going to get to it all, but we're going to just start talking and see what we get to before our time begins to run out, and then uh, we will we'll have a podcast episode. So first thing we need to talk about is Packers making some personnel moves. They have signed linebacker DQ Thomas to their practice squad. He is 6 feet 2 inches tall, 216 pounds out of Middle Tennessee State. He was listed at 226 pounds at his pro day, if that makes any difference to you. But the Packers have him at 216, the same same weight he was listed at on the Middle Tennessee roster. Mr. Thomas, a good overall athlete, not necessarily great at anything. His relative athletic score is over 8, according to his pro day numbers, but he doesn't have an outstanding figure in in any single one testing thing, except for the broad jump, where he cleared 10 feet, which is pretty darn good. Very productive at Middle Tennessee. Uh, a lot of tackles, a lot of tackles for loss, and a surprising number of sacks for a guy who is 216 pounds playing you know, Division One college football. He was so productive, in fact, that he's got a production ratio over one, which is the number that we use to basically gauge a ballpark figure of how good a pass rusher a college player is. 53 tackles for loss, 23 and a half sa- or 20 and a half sacks gets him to a career production ratio of 1.38 when you take into account his total career games, which is pretty wild for a guy who's 216 pounds. Now, He's probably more in like the Tariq Carpenter mold as a pro, more like a dime safety than uh, than anybody who's really going to be consistently rushing the passer. I just mentioned that because it's, a, it's statistically pretty odd to see that from a guy this size. I don't really know what the Packers are doing here. They do need some depth at linebacker. They're probably looking at him as a special teamer. I was surprised that we did not see Ray Wilborn on the 53 last week. Uh, as he, as an elevation from the, the practice squad. Maybe the Packers are just trying to save some of his elevations for later in the year or see what goes on with Chris Barnes or maybe a combination of all those things. As a corresponding move, the Packers have released wide receiver Travis Fulgham from their practice squad, and by law, he now has to sign with the Philadelphia Eagles and have a fantasy football tear. That's just the way things go. Um, also on the practice squad, we should note, we didn't talk about this when it happened last week, but the Packers signed safety Mike Brown, 6'1", 220 pounds. I really have no comment on him other than, boy, the Packers have a lot of safeties right now. And I don't really know what what that is all about other than maybe they're continuing to look for for that real, you know, third safety type. Maybe they're just looking for more special teamers. I don't know. But they've got like seven safeties on the roster between the 53 and the practice squad right now. And that is a lot. Now, on to other things. Uh, I have a couple questions from a, f- a couple listeners here, and I thought I would sprinkle them in uh, around a couple other topics that I wanted to discuss. The first question uh, starts with something really exciting and may end up being a little bit of a, well, well, we'll see here. Uh, this comes from Macro in our Discord server, and he wrote uh, after Sunday's game, watching Jones last night was a thing of art. We all know his contract is structured in a way that basically ensure that, or ensures that it's over at the end of the season. But is there a route where we can see a future for Jones at Green Bay, but on 2022? A good question, and unfortunately the answer I think here is a little bit of a bummer. Because the route pretty much ends here for Aaron Jones. He's got a cap hit of $20 million next year and $16 million in 2024. So the plan is to have him be gone after this year. I think it's pretty clear that that is, that is the case. And I think it's understandable why. If nothing else, you've got A.J. Dillon waiting and waiting to take on a bigger and bigger role. But let's say for a hypothetical, could you get out from that? Yes. An extension probably does get you out of it. It probably changes his cap figures for 25 or 2023 and 2024 significantly. The problem is you would be guaranteeing a cap hit for him through 2025 and 2026 almost assuredly which would be his age 31 and 32 seasons. So the real question here is, as good as he has been so far in in this season, would you want to be on the hook 
for a running back in ages 31 or at ages 31 and 32. And as tough as it is, even if you get a good season out of him at 28 and 29, maybe 30, the answer is still probably no, that you don't want to do that. Running backs just take so many hits, and even a lightly used running back or a guy who was pretty lightly used in Aaron Jones early in his career has already piled up more than a thousand career touches. As of last Sunday, he has touched the ball a thousand thirty one times in his NFL career. Just for comparison, look at what Devontae Adams has had so far in his career. A, a guy who gets the ball a lot for uh, you know, for any position, but especially for a wide receiver. He's had multiple hundred catch seasons. Even though he's played longer than Aaron Jones, he's in his ninth season now, Jones is just in his sixth, Devontae Adams only has 681 career touches. Jones has almost 50% more touches, or maybe actually more than 50% more touches than Devontae Adams. No matter what kind of running back you are, your body is just going to start breaking down at some point. And Jones has already had a couple of different knee injuries, his missed time uh, in two different seasons for, for knee issues. That's not to say he couldn't still be productive maybe like next year at age 29 and maybe even age 30, but if you're on the hook for that contract that long, you're not really helping yourself um, even in the short term. So I think it's probably just a better use of the Packers space to continue to plan to, to move on and try to you know fill in that productivity elsewhere. And we have to keep in mind too that as exciting of a start as this is, it is only two games so far. Now, maybe he'll continue to do that. Maybe he'll still continue to perform at a very high level. He's still a very, very good player. But I don't think counting on that kind of productivity beyond this season and into his 30s is a wise idea. We have seen some interesting things from the Packers' run game so far this season, and we touched on it a little bit after the the last Packers game. They have been running a little bit more of a power oriented run scheme than just zone. Not exclusively, and not even to the point where it's more power than zone, but we have seen a lot of those sweeps, those pin and pull type plays like we talked about after the Sunday game. And that approach is different from what we've seen from the Packers over the years. So I I wanted to pull on a couple threads as to why that might be. Because in theory, and you know, if you ask people that know, zone blocking is easier to implement. The great Offensive line coach Howard Mudd in the book Blood, Sweat, and Chalk that we talked about a few a uh, couple of years ago um, talked about how zone blocking is is easier to implement because you can just kind of throw a bunch of guys in one direction and you just get everybody moving that direction and the running back basically sorts it out behind them. You don't have to worry about one guy blowing up your blocking scheme if everybody is kind of going in the same direction. If one guy isn't responsible for one defender in particular, you can all kind of take care of a group of defenders together. So why do it this way? Something that's technically harder, especially in a year where the Packers are pretty unsettled on the offensive line early. I think it actually has to do with that offensive line. It's an availability question. In the past, I think you could argue that you have fewer guys moving around and certainly fewer new guys moving around. 2019, 2020, 2021, it's really just your top six or seven offensive linemen, and they're moving around a little bit. You sometimes bump Billy Turner from right tackle to left tackle. You bump Elton Jenkins from left guard to left tackle, things like that. You don't have to get to know anybody new, and you can still work as a unit in that zone blocking. You still have all of your chemistry. You still have... um, a zone blocking scheme that even if you're you're trying to do things that's technically easier, you can you can keep everybody's responsibilities pretty familiar, and you're working with a group that's still familiar together. Now think about what you've got, though. You've got in week one one new guy essentially on the field in Jake Hansen, and you've got two guys in new positions. Hansen's at guard, where he's never played before in a game that matters. And Newman and Hansen are in new positions. And I do know that Hansen lined up for like two snaps at guard in 2021. We're not counting those. You know what I mean when I say he's never played that in a game that matters. If you're looking at simplifying things for those guys, especially since there's essentially two new guys 
on the same side of the line, maybe it makes sense to try to do something where they just have to pick up one guy in a scheme. In week two, no technically new guys anymore, no new positions, but still some unfamiliarity. It's a, it's a grouping that you really haven't had together before, left to right, in Nyman, Runyon, Myers, uh, Newman, and Jenkins. You can call man blocking because maybe you're just trying to get to a guy, not a specific area. On top of that, you've got guys that are both big and good athletes. So if you're trying to get them out into space, they can do that pretty well. Josh Myers had some struggles on Sunday, but he also did pretty well as a pulling center. That's something that he hasn't had to do in his own blocking scheme, but it's a way to use his unique physical abilities in a different way. He's six foot five, three hundred and twenty something pounds. You get him moving down the field, and that's a pretty big body for Aaron Jones to run behind. I think there's a bunch of different reasons, I guess, in short, that you might want to go with this way on top of the Packers just having some really great results with some some different sorts of things. I'll be interested to see if they continue to have that kind of success as they go deeper into the season, or even if they stick with this approach at all. But it's been an interesting little mini trend here early in the season. Before we get too far, I want to shout out a couple of our wonderful Patreon supporters, Joe Cash, Mark Reinick, and William Richardson, all faithful Patreon supporters for a while here. And as a reminder of what you get as a Patreon supporter, you get access to our Discord server where you can chat, chat, chat with Packers fans from all around the world. You get interesting bonus content throughout the week, including uh, my handwritten game notes. Uh, Every Monday after a game, uh, you get weekly picks and just uh, other stuff as we're able to get it out. And uh, you get to continue to support uh, the show and help us make it. Uh, It uh, allows us to to pay for the things we need to pay for, like podcast hosting and equipment upgrades and stuff like that, uh, because we don't run ads on the show. And your support that way helps us to continue to make the very best show that we can. So continue to uh, continue. Consider supporting us on Patreon, patreon.com slash thepowersweep, and uh, we'll continue to make the best podcasts we can for you uh, with your support. Speaking of offensive line stuff, uh, I got another question related to the Packers offense from the Jet Sweep guy, again, in our Discord server. Another bonus there, a great way to ask questions, get him on the show. Jet Sweep guy asks, is Yash Nyman a trade target? What price would be enough for the team to pull the trigger? I'm thinking a second round pick or a young proven wide receiver. I see the thinking here, but right now, I don't know if there's a world where the Packers would want to trade Yash Nyman. Don't know if you've heard, but there's a lot of uncertainty with David Bakhtiari. Um, and that, I think, is is a contributing factor in a big way uh, to what the Packers would want to do with not Yash Nyman. In a vacuum, I think your starting point is probably around a second round pick because if you're considering trading for Yash Nyman, you're probably considering him a starting tackle because you're not going to give up assets if you think he's going to be, um, you know, just sitting the bench. So a second round pick, maybe a third round pick just in a vacuum is probably what you would be looking to to offer for, for Yash Nyman or receive for Yash Nyman if you're the Packers. But this year, it would probably take much more than that. And looking beyond this year, I'm not sure the Packers would be interested in training Yash Nyman at all. So here's why. Three reasons. First, there is some big concern with David Bakhtiari, both this year and next. Some uncertainty, at the very least. If the Packers would cut David Bakhtiari after the season, and it certainly would be at least after this season at the earliest, they would still eat $23 million in dead cap space. We're on this ride for a while with David Bakhtiari. And Nyman is part of the solution if Bakhtiari can't play this season or next season. He's got a, they've got a ready-made starting left tackle if Bakhtiari can't play. They could, in theory, cut Bakhtiari as a post-June 1 cut next year, and you're on the hook for just $11.5 million in 2023, but then it's split uh, between 23 and 24, $11.5 million in 2024 as well. So you're going to be on the hook for some, some Bakhtiari salary for a while, if he can't play. So the Packers probably aren't looking to move on from him. They're just going to wait as long as possible until there's they've exhausted every possible avenue for getting him on the field before they finally would decide to cut him, just in part because of the cap space. And as they work through that, ba- uh, Nyman is part of the solution if Bakhtiari can't go. On top of that, Yash is pretty good. Uh, he hasn't been perfect this year. It wasn't perfect last year, but he has proven that he can be a capable enough starting left tackle. And it probably could start on the right side if he needed him too. You don't want to move on from guys like that if you don't have to. 
If he's truly an excess piece, he can move him. But he's not at this point. So unless somebody really backs up the truck, if somebody comes along with the first round pick, you probably got to pull the trigger on that move regardless of whether you want to trade him or not. But don't make that move if you don't have to. But even more importantly, Yash is really cheap. And he's under team control through 2023 as well. He's under a million dollars this year. Um, and as a, as a not ex- yeah, he was an exclusive rights free agent this spring. Um, and then he's a restricted free agent next spring. So his price tag is still going to be pretty low, even if you put a second round tender or a first round tender on him. As far as starting tackles go or starting caliber tackles go, he's going to be amazingly cheap. So I think you put a first or a second round tender on him next spring and just say, just dare somebody else to, to try to sign him and then decide at that point if you want to offer him the big big extension after that. But even if, if the Packers tender him, it's still an affordable deal for a starting caliber left tackle. Maybe not an elite left tackle. He's certainly probably not a pro bowler or an all pro, but a guy that you can count on to be in the starting lineup and be reasonably good is worth something. And having that certainty on the offensive line is a good thing. So the Packers probably aren't moving on to him, from him for those three reasons. Uh, but if somebody really came along and offered a first-round pick, I think you would have to trade him. Flipping over to the defensive side, I think through two weeks, my biggest concern on defense, other than some inconsistency, has to be the edge rushers. We talked about this a little bit after the game, too. Wanted to pull on this thread a little bit more. Roshan Gary and Preston Smith are playing at a frankly unsustainable rate. They are on the field almost all the time, and they're the only edge rushers doing anything to get after the quarterback. And this is an unsustainable phenomenon. They're just playing, I don't want to say too much, because you like the amount that they're, they're playing, or the, you like the product, productivity so far. But Preston Smith has played 87% of snaps. Roshan Gary has played 82% of snaps. That's a lot. And that workload is is going to catch up to them at some point. And if one of them gets hurt, then the Packers are in real troubles on the edge. So what options do the Packers have to try to get around that scenario? Assuming that guys like J.J. and Nikbari are not al- are ready for a bigger role, or Tipa Naliai or Jonathan Garvin are not going to suddenly become big pass rushing threats on the outside. So what options do we have? First, you go back in time and you draft George Karlaftis in the first round. The Devontae Wyatt pick is going to be a talking point for some time because he's coming along fairly slowly. He may may still be a a very good player. But the Packers passed on Karlaftis, a guy like Logan Hall, who's not an edge rusher, but he's he's in that sort of mold, would have been more help on the defensive line too. And three of the guys regarded as some of the best safeties in the draft. That's a bunch of guys the Packers could have had that would have helped in some areas of need on this Packers team right now, rather than just going with the depth piece in Devontae Wyatt. I'm not saying either decision is right or wrong, but the Packers did decide to leave an area of weakness fairly weak in favor of drafting a depth piece someplace else. That is, that's going to be something that's going to have to be talked about for a while. The first real option is signing some edge help now. Free agency is pretty thin, but we did talk about a few guys a while back as potential options. So let's check in on those four guys that we talked about previously. Those four were Jason Pierre-Paul, Ryan Kerrigan, Carl Nassib, and D. Ford. Jason Pierre-Paul visited the Ravens for a second time this week. So if you're looking to get him on the field with the Packers, your window of opportunity is probably shrinking. I think there's a fair conversation to be had about whether or not he is still a, a a valuable piece to any defense in 2022, but I think he's still likely better as a pass rusher for sure than Jonathan Garvin, than Tiba Naliai, than probably J.J. Nigbari at this point. So if you're just looking to shore up your, your pass rush, get some depth there, he's probably a viable option in a very small role. But like I said, your window of opportunity is shrinking. He would still fr- probably command a pretty decent salary too. Unrelated to this, Semi-related to this, the Ravens also had former Packers linebacker Blake Martinez in for a visit today. I hope they sign him and give him a billion dollars because he's a pretty nice guy. Um, And he deserves to continue to make uh, as much money as he can because he did a lot of good work for the Packers. And um, just wish him the best. Elsewhere on our list of potential options, Ryan Kerrigan, uh, probably out of the game now. Uh, He's now a coach for the Washington Commanders. You make that move if you just are done. 
you don't want to continue to, to work out and go through the, the effort of staying in, in um, NFL playing caliber shape. So he's got a, a sweet gig with the Washington Commanders, a team that he played for uh, earlier in his career. He's, he's ready to move on. Carl Nassib, definitely not an option. He is now signed with the Buccaneers, so that option is out. D. Ford, still available. I have not found much evidence, if any, of him garnering really any significant interest. Uh, after Derek Barnett had his big injury in Philadelphia, a couple people said that maybe the Eagles should sign him. There doesn't seem to be any real momentum to that storyline. In theory, he can be a, a spot rusher <laughs> as on the edge. It's been pretty rough injury-wise for him over the years, even worse than, than some of the other guys on the list. So it's understandable, I think, that he has not garnered much interest. Other potential options. R- jumping in the time machine, the Packers had some interest in Taco Charlton last September. The Packers had him in for a visit. A former first-round pick, pretty good athlete, teammates with Rashawn Gary way back in the day. The the rub for Charlton is, even if the Packers were interested, they would have to sign him off the Saints practice squad, so they'd have to put him on the active roster right away. And I just don't know if they're interested in doing that. The other name that, that came up in a couple discussions I had with people about potential edge rusher options was uh, Everson Griffin. Well into his 30 now, 30s now, has been fairly productive for a couple different teams over the past couple of years. He had five sacks in nine games for the Vikings last year, which is not inconsiderable. That seems pretty desperate. He's not really a true outside linebacker type. He would just be a guy that you're just trying to get any kind of juice from your pass rush from. Would be a little bit of a different signing for the Packers. Just goes to show that the options are pretty limited here in terms of free agency right now. But that's not to say there aren't options out there or not potential options out there yet. Because the Packers could still wait and hope for somebody to get released like Whitney Merciless was last year. And somebody is going to get moved like that at some point. These teams are going to start to move around a little bit in terms of being contenders or not contenders. And guys are going to say, hey, you know, I'd like to chase a ring. I would like to to have some new opportunities. And teams will oblige those guys because it happens every year. So at some point, someone's going to get released. And the Packers just have to be ready. A waiver claim, something like that. They need some help. And they've got to hope that a guy like that comes along. There is also one other option that really we haven't seen anything even hinting at would be a possibility so far, but they could play Quay Walker on the edge a little bit. We've talked about this in the far distant past. Micah Parsons, similar physical attributes to Quay Walker, has done a lot of that in Dallas. And the Packers haven't really brought any pressure from their non-edge guys so far. Maybe it's time if you're not at least lining Walker up as a true edge rusher type, not standing him up outside of tackle or something like that. Maybe it's time to start exploring some blitz-related options with Quay Walker. The problem is, if you're going to do that, this week is probably not the time to do that. Tom Brady is excellent against the blitz. He's excellent at getting the ball out quickly. So if you're going to try to blitz him, you have to be willing to live with the consequences. Now, maybe you say, well, look at their wide receiver room right now. It's all beat up. Mike Evans is probably suspended for Sunday, may be suspended for Sunday. If he's going to try to get the ball out quick, who's he going to throw it to? Which is fair. Do you really want to take that chance against Tom Brady? Long-term, Quay may may be an option um, either on the edge or just as a blitzer a little bit more. But in the meantime, you're you're probably just going to have to ride it out for this week against Tom Brady. And given the state of the Buccaneers' offensive line, maybe that's okay for another week. But I am concerned about the amount of playing time that Preston and Rashawn have had to play. It's almost assuredly unsustainable. Finally, last week, uh, we mentioned, we talked about drops being a learnable skill for wide receivers. Christian Watson had a fairly noteworthy drop in week one. Uh, And so we had a a listener question about whether or not uh, guys can improve that over time. So I went and looked back at a few noteworthy Packers wide receivers, all of whom seem to have had trouble with drops over their career, and wanted to see how they improved over time. And all of them did. You look at Greg Jennings, Randall Cobb, Devontae Adams, Jordy Nelson, and James Jones, and all of them had a double-digit drop rate in 
one or both of their first two years in the NFL. James Jones was dropping 13.3% of his targets as far out as his fourth year in the NFL. And Jordy Nelson was doing the same into his fifth year. But all of them got better over time. The area you saw the most improvement from all these guys was in intermediate drops. Um, Intermediate routes are qualified by Pro Football Focus, who I used as the source for all the data in this little mini study. Um, Intermediate routes are are 10 to 19 19 yards downfield. So all of them made big strides on those sort of intermediate routes. Greg Jennings, in particular, had a big run, a big jump in his intermediate and his short routes. So Jennings dropped over 10% of his targets in his third season uh, from in short yardage situations, zero to nine yards downfield. But the rest of his career in Green Bay, he never dropped more than 4.2% of his targets the rest of the way. The other four years he played in Green Bay. After that, he went off to Minnesota. Things got a little bit worse because I think he played with worse quarterbacks the final three years of his career. But improvement is possible. Uh, Randall Cobb went from dropping uh, 12.5% of his targets as a rookie down to two years where he's had zero drops. 2016 and 2021, he had zero drops in his time in Green Bay. Uh, Devontae Adams, famously rough year as a as a second-year receiver, started out dropping 8% of his targets as a rookie, up to 15.6% in his second year, then down to 9, 6.3, 4.3. Jumped up a bit in 2019 to 8.3, but down under 3% in 2020 and 2021. He also started running dramatically shorter routes, uh, but also did a lot better in the the deep and intermediate areas too over the course of his career. Jordy Nelson, similar story. Took him a little bit while, a a little bit longer to get going. He had some particular struggles uh, in the in the the middle distance areas, uh, dropping 20% of his targets as a rookie there. 17% 17% or so in 2010. It was rough for him for a while, but he too improved things. Uh, he didn't d- get quite as low as some of the other guys on this list, but I think that's because he was running a lot of his routes deeper than Devontae Adams or Randall Cobb or, or Jennings or Jones. Jones as well saw some big improvement in the middle areas of the field, uh, but also in the short yardage areas too. He had, of all the guys that I looked at here, the most struggles in the short yardage um areas for for receiving consistency, I guess, uh, was dropping 17.6% of his targets his first year uh, from zero to nine yards. He eventually got much better there. Now, as improv- as, as good as this is, uh, as at showing that improvement is possible, I would caution here a little bit that this is, for one, a small sample size, and two, we've got some selection bias here. We've got five guys that turned out to be good players, and looking at the course of their career and seeing how they improved may not necessarily be that informative because it's guys that, you know, lasted that long. They had the opportunity to improve because they, they did keep improving for one. Uh, but, you know, we saw the long-term career arc that all these guys had because they were good enough to stick around. There's a bunch of wide receivers the Packers have drafted that haven't gotten a chance to improve necessarily because they haven't stuck around that long. Ty Montgomery is probably a bad example, but he didn't last with the Packers through the entirety of his rookie deal. Trevor Davis didn't either. Uh, Jeff Janis, a a drafted wide receiver, never really got enough targets to see how much he was improving. Uh, Equinemius St. Brown, same same kind of deal. Hard to say how much he improved over the course of his career because he never really was on the field consistently enough to, to see if he was improving. But I do think all those qualifications aside, there is reason to think that guys like Christian Watson and Romeo Dobbs can improve their drop rate over the course of their career. Now, will they? We'll see. But it is possible. I think they're both talented players, and uh, they're going to get the opportunity to continue to improve in Green Bay because they're going to be an important part of the Packers' offense this year and beyond. That's all I've got for in this episode of Blue 58. I appreciate you listening in. I'd appreciate it even more if you would take a second and share this episode with someone you think would enjoy it. It's going to help more people find the show, and it's going to get more people involved in this conversation that you and I are having about the Green Bay Packers, which in turn is going to help all of us me included, become smarter Packers fans. And as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.